Thanks for taking time to listen to this episode of The Real Rescue Podcast. Take a minute to go to therealrescue.com to check out these and other great deals from our sponsors here at The Real Rescue. This episode of The Real Rescue Podcast is brought to you by Breeze Eastern, the world's only dedicated helicopter hoist and winch provider. SR3 Rescue Concepts, because you don't know what you don't know. And rescueswimmershop.com, official high quality apparel featuring the silhouette. Breeze Eastern, they dedicate themselves to our helicopter rescue world. Since the very first helicopter rescue in November of 1945, Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured superior rescue hoist solutions. While much of the technology and the unique mission requirements have changed over the past 75 years, their commitment to the rescuers, the operators, and those being rescued has not. Contact them today by visiting them at breeze-eastern.com. SR3 Rescue Concepts is a training company that can help your helicopter training. They train daytime, nighttime, aerial firefighting, hoist, longline, fast rope, rappel, and more. They can assist your program with standardization and safety checks or just an FAA annual refresher. With the certified flight instructor pilots and experienced crew, they are ready to help your agency keep up to date with current techniques, rules, regulations, and equipment. Plus, right now, SR3 is offering 10% off anything in their web store with the promo code, all capital letters, Real Rescue, R E A L R E S Q. Plus, they are offering 10% from their partners, Petzl and their equipment, all you got to do is send an email to info at sr3rescueconcepts.com. Mention this podcast, The Real Rescue Podcast, and they'll take care of the rest. 15 years ago, photographer and Coast Guard rescue swimmer number 526, Chris Razor, created an iconic photograph. This photograph depicted the silhouette of a helicopter rescue swimmer reaching down for an outstretched hand in need against the American flag backdrop. The image went viral and became a symbol worldwide for the rescue community and the people they help. Its wild popularity inspired Chris to launch RescueSwimmerShop.com, a web store offering official high quality apparel featuring his evocative image, The Silhouette. T-shirts, hats, patches, and stickers featuring the silhouette are available at RescueSwimmerShop.com, including the flagship design, So Others May Live. Follow Chris and his story on Instagram with the handle, at RescueSwimmerShop. And if you are a rescue swimmer, support rescue swimmers, or just tell people you are one at the bar, this gear is definitely for you. When you get to the website, rescueswimmershop.com, enter the promo code, all lowercase, one word, rescue, R-E-S-C-U-E, for 10% off your order. I always love the opportunity to sit down with United States Coast Guard rescue swimmers. Their stories never cease to amaze me. Even the ones that seem so benign and so small, they make such an impact in our lives, and I love hearing them. So please welcome our next guest, United States Coast Guard rescue swimmer number 230, Mr. Harold Hoffmaster. My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard rescue swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is The Real Rescue Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Real Rescue Podcast. Today I've got a guy who, it's kind of crazy how it works in the Coast Guard because we have such a small group of guys, but for whatever reason, Mr. Harold Hoffmaster and myself never actually met, which is crazy. But we're going to talk about it with him today on the show. So please welcome United States Coast Guard rescue swimmer number 230, Mr. Harold Hoffmaster. What's up, buddy? How much, Jason. How are you doing today? 
Dude, I am fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me at The Real Rescue. It's just, this is going to be fun uh, and just Thanks, because it's going to be. Which, another reason, like, it, it really does blow me away that you and I have never met in person. <laughs> I know that, you know, and there's there's a bunch of people out there that I, I've talked to and heard and, and, and you know, seen on Facebook and never ran into them. Right. But it doesn't matter. You know, it's 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 still a brotherhood. Totally. That's great. Yeah. And, I, you know, it's the other thing is you start seeing people, you know, like who's in charge of what shop at what time. And then, uh, you know, you, then you're looking at like with all your peers, who's on the advancement list and where you rank. <laughs> so you start seeing everybody's name, no matter what, whether you meet them or not. Yeah. I think what's, what's even weirder is I see uh, guys that I had in my shop. There were third classes that are retiring now. Like John Holberg, when he retired, I'm like, oh, yeah, nice. God, <laughs> the trouble that guy put me through and now he's retiring. Uh, God. <laughs> idiot i'm just kidding <laughs> awesome i love it well uh harold if you don't mind please introduce yourself to everybody out there just kind of a little bit of who you are a little bit of background to you how you joined the coast guard and how you became a rescue swimmer all right so uh, in 1986 i was graduating high school and i was working at a department store really had no idea what i was going to do I remember it distinctively. Uh, it was from a small town in Pennsylvania. It's called Fredericksville. And it's right between- I know Redding exactly and where it is. That's crazy. Right. Actually, no, I yep. don't. That's such a lie. <laughs> <That's small. laughs> there's no water there. There's nothing there, man. <laughs> but it's right between Reading and Allentown. People usually know Reading from the yep. Reading Railroad and Allentown, Billy Joel. So anyways, I remember I came down one morning and my dad was uh, drinking his coffee and he pulled out this newspaper article and it said search and rescue and law enforcement. And it's just a tiny little piece, just a tiny little ad in the one in the classifieds. I look at it. And the first thing that caught me was law enforcement. I'm like, Coast Guard. I, don't, I didn't even know what that was. So then I looked into it and I'm thinking, wow, I'm going to be on one of those one tens out of, you know, out of Key West, busting people with, you know, my gun yeah. and everything. <laughs> so I went to the recruiter in Harrisburg. And uh, they met me at a small outpost. And I remember going to the recruiter and he really had no interest in me joining. It was like I was bothering him to come there. Oh, no he way. The, yeah, he showed me a confidant's bulletin. I, and I remember looking at it and thinking, I'm going to take this home and look at it. And I distinctly remember him saying, oh, you got to keep that here. I need that. You can't take that. <laughs> what, what, what's the secret here? What's going on? So I went through the process, took my ASVAB, did everything, and then let my numbers out to the other services and everybody's, Oh yeah, yeah, we want you. We want you. But the coast guard never really called back. Army was calling me everything. So I'm like, I, I got to check this coast guard thing out. Long story longer. I uh, went and talked to him again and had no idea about being a swimmer, nothing like that. I just wanted to get out of my small town Yeah. and thought I was going to be law enforcement. And um, they offered me, he calls me up and he says, I got a four-year enlistment or a two-year enlistment. He said, it's a brand new thing, a two-year enlistment. We're trying out. What do you want to do? I said, two-year. He goes, all right, if you do a two-year, we got to leave in two weeks. Like, all right, Holy let's go. Smoke. Yeah. So I went to boot camp, and it was great. You know, I, boot camp wasn't as bad. You know, it wasn't too bad. I went got through that. Got to my first station in Newburyport, Massachusetts. You're probably familiar with that place. Newburyport. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know well. Town, right? <laughs> so I get there. I'm on small boats and uh, thinking – I'm going to be a bosun mate. And then I'm seeing bosun mates getting the mop out and cleaning and doing all this stuff. And, and I'm thinking if I can be a bosun mate on small boats my whole career, that would be great. But you don't get to do that. You know, you have to go do bigger stuff. Yeah, yeah. So then bigger boats. Of, yeah, yeah. Actual real boats, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Butter. So then I, I'm thinking storekeeper because the department store I worked, I was talking with a guy in the back. And he was a storekeeper and he's like, uh, this is a good job. I'm like, all right. So then six months later, this woman walks into the station, this new Coastie. And everybody's checking her out, looking out the rec deck, checking her out. I'm the only one that didn't check her out. It was horrible. Back in those days, it was 87. It was like, I hate to say this, but it was like fresh meat coming in. All the guys were like, oh, my God, check her out. So I didn't. We got to know each other. She stood, you know, the, the watch with me in the radio room, we started talking. Well, we started dating. And wow. Didn't yes. even look at her. Look at you. No, I think that's a <laughs> her. She was like, why isn't he? It's kind of like how I joined the Coast Guard. Like, he's not interested. 
Oh. Hey, for the record, uh, you should never date blue. Stay away from blue. That means well, don't date within the service. Well, <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyways, we, we start dating, right? Nobody knew we were dating except my best friend and her best friend there. Finally, the word got out and, and we, nothing was inappropriate. No one, you know, even knew we were dating at the time. So the OINC who was the senior chief. He found out and he was cool about it. You know, he said, Hey, I don't see any, anything wrong with it. Um, one day we're on a star case just on, on our 41 footer going out there. And I see this Coast Guard helicopter and I see somebody hanging out the back. Like what, what is that? And she, <laughs> she knew, she's like, Oh, that's a swimmer. You know, that's the ASMs. I want to do that. So we start, you know, here we are eating our little church not there forever with our bag of Oreos. And, and that's all we had to eat. And those guys fly, do their stuff and go home, you know? Yeah. So I'm like, all right, let's do that. So I get on the ASM list. She gets on the public, the PA list, photojournalist list. And so I'm like, well, I should probably train for this. So we go to the local YWCA and I do my swim and I'm done. I'm like, all right, I think I can do this. Well, what she didn't tell me years later is after I graduated, like how horrible I was. She was scared for me swimming because I, I was, <laughs> I was, I was beating, beating the water up, right? So, it, but she never said anything. She, she, if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have did this, you know? So we kept going. Well, we got married. We got married because, well, obviously we love each other, but we didn't know each other very long, but she was going to public affairs school and I was going to swimmer school. Yeah. And I remember calling the detailer. I think his name was C CWO Harris. Okay. And here I am, you know, going, Hey, I'm, I'm going to go to rescue swimmer school. My wife's going to public affairs school. One's in Elizabeth city. One's in Fort Harrison, Indiana, Fort Benjamin Harrison, Indiana. And his, his response was, well, the chance of you graduating that school are pretty, pretty low anyway. So we'll just see what happens. <laughs> you know, what's funny is they said the same thing to me too. Like, yeah. Well, it, thanks for the vote of confidence. <laughs> I know. I'm thinking he's like, all right, that's great. And, you know, we'll, we'll meet, you know, you guys will hook up. Cause they had to put, they had to put us at a place where it's a bigger area. Cause she's public affairs and it had to be an air station. Right. Right. So I'm like, wow. So anyways, I went, uh, we, uh, got married and we both left for school. It was pretty much around the same time, October of 89. Um, I had a great time at my small boat station. We went through heavy surf. You know, you, I'm sure you heard about the Merrimack River, how rough it gets there. Oh, yeah. So um, I spent some time with Tom Guthline, who's very well known in the boat world. And, and we almost tipped over a couple of times. It was, it was pretty great. So fast forward to swimmer school. So I get to swimmer school. And this was 87. It's not like now when the kids go in there, they're these CrossFit beasts already. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you look yeah. at these kids like, oh, he's a swimmer. You know, I, I did yeah. not look like that. So I uh I get to school and my in test, my swim test. Well, first of all, the sun, the Saturday there, I come running down the, the donut, the stairs in there. Yep. yep. Boom, turn my ankle. I'm like, oh god. That was that was when you showed up. That was the Saturday before we checked in Monday. <laughs> <laughs> just, I didn't, you know, it wasn't like broken. I just turned it and it hurt like hell. And I'm like, oh. so I went to sick call and they said, okay, come back Monday morning. They gave me some IV, you know, 800 milligrams of ibuprofen, you know, come back Monday morning. Yeah. And for us in the Coast Guard, that was vitamin M. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, take 800 milligrams of Motrin, you're fine. Chuck it up. <laughs> yeah. And I still, we still have some in the, in the uh, medicine cabinet today. Yeah. Milligrams. Right. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> So they said, come back Monday. Well, I'm not coming back Monday. I'm not going to sick call my first day of summer school. So I sucked it up. I got to school and uh, everything was fine until we got in the pool. First thing, and you might not have done this because you were later, but we had to do a 500 meter swim, which was the breast side and crawl. It was no, combined. I, I just had to do a crawl swim, just right. 500 crawl. It changed years after. But okay. so with that, I'm in there and I thought I could swim. Well, I didn't know you had to put your face in the water when you swam. Like, who does that? I'm <laughs> I thought this was Baywatch. Come on. Yeah. Look at the town I'm from. We had no water there. So it, 
I went to the pool and I could go in the, you used to have to take a test to go in the, off the diving board. If you could swim across the, the deep end of the pool, you were good to go. You could go off the dive board. So I was like, I'm a swimmer. So I get in the pool, start swimming and or swimming and my head's out of the water because I, I, I can't breathe. So I'm beating the hell out of the water, right? Swimming, swimming, swimming. I'm still swimming. The other five guys in my class are done in the deep end treading water. I'm, and I can see this. My re- it took me 17 minutes and 48 seconds to finish that swim. Oh my God. I, I'm pretty sure I hold the record. If you ask Flythe, I think I still hold the record. <laughs> it, was, it was horrible. The horrible thing was, first of all, I was exhausted. My neck was so stiff. I never touched bottom. I didn't quit. I never gave up. I felt so bad. I, you know Gary Streeby? Uh, I do not, no. Okay, he was, he was the only one that stayed in for a long time. But I, Gary Streeby was in my class, and he retired as a W4. He, was, he had a really huge case in Alaska. He's a good guy. I felt bad for these guys, right? Because these guys were done in like 11, 10, 11 minutes, you know, and I'm doing 17 minutes. So <laughs> I'm thinking I'm done. So after that day, they call me in. It was Bill Rankin called me in and he was an old instructor and I'm thinking I'm going home day one. And then what he told me, he said, look, you worked harder than any of those guys out there. He said, you didn't touch bottom. We watched you for 17 minutes. He said, you did not quit. He said, and that's what we want. He said, you had the mental fortitude to not quit. So for survivors out there, you're not just going to be like, this is too much for me. I give up. He said, you're going to keep going. And I never thought about that. I just, didn't want to quit. I've never liked quitting. He said, but you need to get your ass in the pool more. And you, you know, you need to start swimming and you need to get better at this or you're going home. So I went through and, and they're teaching me. So my guys are teaching Gary Streeb. He's teaching me in the locker room. He had me laying on the benches and doing my strokes and learning how to breathe out underwater and everything. That and is awesome. Time, that is a yeah, great he, classmate, by the way. That's so like, that's coming. brotherhood before we even had the, we even graduated. You know, man, that's awesome. I he wanted that. me to succeed. And he also didn't want me to have to swim so long so he wouldn't <laughs> tread water with the brick either. So there was a little bit of motivation for his part there. <laughs> but, you know, they gave me crap. Don't get me wrong. They, they all gave me crap. My, I had a pretty good bunch of guys, but um, I was able to I was able to take it. And so they helped me a lot. Right. But the problem was we were going to the, the pool at East City at the, at the base wasn't open. We had to go to the College of East City to swim. So we didn't it was, we didn't have access all the time. So I remember going in and talking to Flythe and Rankin and saying, is there any way I can get to the pool at night and swim on my own? Cause they had remedial swim for people who failed, you know, yeah, the, the air crew test and everything. So I said, can I go to that all the time and swim? So I did. And a couple of guys came with me. A lot of guys would go to Virginia, you know, to party and everything. And I'm going to the pool to swim. Um, wow. There were times Flythe looks at me and you know, it's supposed to be, Pull, kick, glide, pull, kick, glide. That's what they wanted you to do. Well, yeah. I pull, kick, sink. I wasn't exactly svelte. I, I, I boom, right to the bottom. Uh, so during that time, I remember him looking at me and saying, son, you might want to rethink your career decision in his little accent, you know. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is it again. So, But, but I made it. My out time was um, nine something. So I knocked it down to nine. It's amazing when you actually can learn how to breathe properly. The time yeah, right. So nothing else had a problem. I, the push-ups, pull-ups, the run, the sit-ups, that was all easy for me. Um, even the, the running, like, I don't know if you ever ran with, ran with uh, Flythe, but his pace was so horrible. We as a class would purposely screw up the cadence so we drop and do push-ups. So we get back into rhythm. The, we, we, it was so funny. It was, <laughs> none of us minded that, so. But anyways, um, then I go to Pensacola. That's the time we still went to P- Pensacola. And that was not an issue at all. It was to the people that went through East City and got their butts beat there. Yeah. Pensacola was pretty much a breeze. So that was my A school. That's how I, that's how I became a swimmer. You know, I, I, I'm going to add one more thing in there. And we, there's another podcast out there. If anybody has not seen it yet, it's called The Rescue Sort of Mindset. It talks yes. about exactly what you're talking about. The mindset not to quit. Don't quit. You, you to this push day, I'm forward. Stubborn about that. Yeah. yeah. Like you can't, you, you cannot make it in this job 
if you're, if you have the quitter mind, Oh, I just, I quit. I can't do it. Nope. That's not an option. Yeah, like mother it, nature doesn't care. It's not an option. <laughs> There's no training time out when you're in 30 foot seas. It's just, it doesn't happen. Hurricanes don't yeah. just, ah, training time out. Hurricane, just stop. No, it doesn't work. So you can't, you, you know, you, you just, it's, it's not an option. And it not wasn't respect. for me to grab the side or, or touch the bottom. Yeah. Cause I knew at that point, well, there was some motivation also because the recruit, the, you know, the, the, the detailer had said, you know, you probably won't make it. So he's already planning on sending me to some cutter already yeah. somewhere where my wife's going to be stationed. And, and meanwhile, my wife's going through public affairs school, which wasn't a breeze. They, for the Coast Guard, had higher standards than all the others. She had to always get like a, at least a 70 percent, 70 or 75 percent. And the other services, the Marines and Army that she went through, they were like at 60 percent. Wow. So she was, you know, she was having to do some some work there, too. So we both graduate. She gets to. She gets, we go to Governor's Island, Governor's Island, New York. Sweet. Was that still active when you were, was that still? It was not. So that had just gotten closed while I was still in. Like, so I came in and we had New York, we had uh, Cape May, and then they made Atlantic City while I was in. Oh, so that's, I was there when, when, when you came in and that's where I was. Yeah. So, but, uh, so she gets to Brooklyn, she gets to Governor's Island, and she gets to go to the air station while I'm still in school. Because our school was a little short, 10 weeks. Ours was 18 weeks. Or I like to say 18 weeks of hell, I've always said. <laughs> <laughs> so she had 10 weeks. She gets there and she calls me one day. And she's like, hey, I just went flying in a 65 today. And I'm like, I'm going through all this and you get to fly before me. So they took her out on a flight, you know, and it's it pretty cool. So I show up at Brooklyn and there I meet Steve Ober. Swimmer number one. He was the first rescue athlete. swimmer number one. Yes, yes. Awesome. A little, a little, a little intimidating. Um, so I get there, and he wasn't the shop, shop chief at the time. There was another guy who hadn't gone through the swimmer program. He was one of those that was kind of wavered. Yep. But Steve really ran the show because no one really. It was weird. No one really listened to the other guy. They didn't didn't respect him. It was weird. They're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. We just finished swimmer school. So I was, you know, I was there with. Olaf Lavelle, he was at my, he was at Brooklyn and he kind of took me under his wing. Beautiful. So it, it was a great shop. We had some, some great people there. So as I'm getting qualified, uh, Steve's taking me out to get for my last check ride. We're going out and we get out there and as we're flying, we get the star case, um, boat overturned in New York Harbor. And I think it was three or four people that were submerged under the boat. So we're going, telling the pilots, you know, not me, but Steve was like, let's go, let's go, let's beat that boat, let's get there. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, how cool would that be? Because he tells me, and I'll never forget, because you had to take your helmet off and yell in each other's ear, because he didn't want to go to the ICS. He goes, I'll go in first, then you come in, and we'll take care of these people. He goes, we do that, you're qualified. We'll work together, and you're qualified, you're done. I'm thinking, this is awesome. This is, this is awesome. So my stand check will be a SAR case. Oh, that's badass. I know. So we're getting there. I'm all pumped. You know, I'm like putting my hoodie on and, you know, just so stoked for this. Boat Beats is there. NYPD Boat Beats is there. They already threw their divers in. So then Steve, I don't, if you ever get to know Steve, he, he tried to make everything happen. He was a go-getter. He's telling the pilots, look, you put us in and the divers will go under and that way they can just hand us the victims. They don't have to surface again. And we can take them and put them and get them out. It'll be a team. They didn't fall for it. They're like, no, they got it under control. So we just had to sit there and watch. Like, oh. bummer. <laughs> and then, then you I did my boy stand check. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say. Then you got to go back and do a stand check. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was like, damn. So I got qualified, and then my very first, my, my real first case was a, uh, um, a girl was in and out of consciousness on a dive boat. In New York, they'd, they'd always take dive boats out. So, but it got pretty rough out there. And according to my old messages and everything, the seas were 20 foot, there's 20 foot seas. So the dive boat was getting tossed around. Yeah. So I get lowered as I'm getting lowered. It's pretty rough, but I'm too stupid to know any different. I'm like, well, whatever. Boom. Slammed right into the, into the wheelhouse. Oh God. Grabbing onto everything, holding onto it. And I slammed in there. I'm like, <sighs> regroup, regroup. And they finally let me lower down on the deck, which is, Weird because the dive boats have this 
huge wide open area. Yeah. yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're wide open, but because of the seas, they, I forget who my flight maker was, but I got slammed right into the, into the wheelhouse, which is fine. I got down here I am. You know, I'm, I'm a rescue swimmer. I'm here to help you, you know? And, and it, so I'm talking to people I'm like, oh yeah, she's in the cabin right there. So I go in there. It's this young girl in a bikini and she's in and out of consciousness. I'm talking to her and she's like, oh, I, I, apparently she hit her head on an air tank because her air tank's like, I'm like, all right, all right. And I'm, this story is so, so much about being laser focused or uh, actually tunnel vision. So I'm like, okay. So I'm getting her, I'm, I'm, you know, checking her out, doing all the EMT stuff, talking to the helo saying, all right, we're going to send the litter down because she hit her head, you know? So sent the litter down. I get her all packaged up. Right. I, uh, so this is how I'm telling my wife this story. I got home, you know, later on the next day and I tell my wife this, I'm telling her, I'm like, look, so I get her in, right. I take, she had some jean shorts there. So I looked for her ID because nobody on the boat seemed to care about her. They were like, yeah. I'm like, well, we're taking her to, you know, I forget Jacoby hospital, or whatever. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm like, what, what's going on here? I go in her jeans, shorts to get her ID. And there's like a roll of money in there. I'm like, whatever, put it back in there. No ID. Package her up, tell them again. I'm like, all right, we're going to get out of here. So they hoist me up. I get her in the helicopter. She's in and out of consciousness. She's telling me, um, please don't tell my parents. Please don't tell my, you know, don't come. Don't tell my parents I was on this boat. It's all going over my head. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying, testing your pupils, doing all my EMT stuff, you know? <laughs> And she's, it's just crazy. So I, as I'm telling my wife the whole story, at the end, she goes, you know, she was a hooker, right? I'm like, what? No. What do you mean? Yeah, like what? The, again, I'm from a small, I, when I, if I could show you my town, you know, understand it's such a small town. I didn't know about it. I, I'd never thought about that. And so I'm talking to my buddy who I went to my first station with also, and he's a coxswain at Smallwood Station, New York. And I'm telling you about this. He goes, yeah, dude, he's, they, they take escorts out all the time on those dive boats for in-between dives. This was, remember, this was 87 or like not 80, 88, 89. That's horrible. I, I didn't know this. So she, to me, she was just some young girl who needed help. And yeah, I was so tunnel vision on that. I never looked at the op optics of it. it it was crazy. So that was my first case. And you know what? Way to treat yeah. her exactly like you would treat any other patient. It, Good it job. Was, it was a patient to me, man. It was, it was great. <laughs> That's so hilarious. That was, that was my first case. And, uh, you know, of course, you never follow up, see how she is or anything. But she was. She was in and out of consciousness. And it was, it was rough seas out there. It was pretty bad. So 20, 20 feet. I mean, that, that's pretty gnarly, no matter how you look yeah. at it. I'm yeah. actually surprised the dive boat even went out. Like, I know so what you were out there. I think I think the storm came in or something, but it was it was crazy. So, um, <laughs> maybe not. To, I don't know. You know how the messages say. See, back then we used to get these messages. Like after you did your case, the message would come out. Yeah. So, it, it could be like a George stands or, you know, if ten feet if there were hundred feet that day. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Little exaggeration was, from here. It was wow. rough enough for the boat to be tossed up so that as I was getting lowered, I hit the wheelhouse. But to me, it was no big deal. It was like, well, this is what I do. This is my job now. Yeah. Um, so then at, at Brooklyn, we've had, I had so many dive cases, so many CPR, unsuccessful CPR, father, son, you know, and, and they would be mixing gases. This time when they started mixing gases. And I remember getting the father and son and, and the father didn't make it because they were, he was a master diver and, you know, they were doing all this stuff, you know, all this crazy yeah. mixing of the gas. So I wanted to learn about this. So NYPD was right on the base with us. So they offered us, Hey, why don't you guys come to a dive course with us? Sweet. Right? So I didn't really want to be a scuba diver. I, I never really thought about it, but I wanted to do it so I could learn about what my patients would be going through. Yeah. So I went with the NYPD scuba guys and God, those guys were just, like you see on TV, they're just ruthless, funny. <laughs> you think like the like swimmer shops, you know how they are? They're like, oh, yeah. and these guys were right there with them. They were bad. For, for example, one case we did it, we did a search 
they were doing a search underwater behind yeah. our air station in Brooklyn. And uh, they failed to tell this other swimmer, Pat Barry, that went with him. I don't know if you know Pat Barry. He's an older guy. No. Nope. Um, what they did there. So Pat Barry's, they follow these lines under, because there's no visibility. So right. you're following the lines. And he comes in and feels around, and it's a baby. Oh. The mannequin baby. But they didn't tell him that was there. That was that they're searching for. He shoots to the top, freaks out. Oh my God. And he's having a panic attack. And they're oh cracking my. up. They think it's the funniest thing in the world. That's like, terrible. Like pissed. it's kind of funny, but that's terrible. <laughs> it's funny now, but he was and and if you oh ever knew God. Pat, he was just so high strung anyways, but it was it was pretty funny. So I don't mean to laugh. That's awful. But no, it was it was we were cracking up at it, you know, because we, we were just as ruthless. You know, that's just how you are. You you take stupid, horrible, disgusting things and you laugh at it. That's how you yeah. deal with it. That's how you cope. So, so I did that. I finished finished that, and then I still had some more dive cases um, that they just come up all the time. Like now, put the red helo on the line. We got a dive case. Like oh my god. So. Um, and then a couple other things in Brooklyn that were pretty, pretty big to me, but this one I didn't even get in the water, but it was a uh, hurricane Bob came through and it was rough, horrible. We shouldn't have went out, but we got the phone. We got a call that there was a, a boat out there that was uh, 30 miles off Montauk and that the guy had burnt his hands and okay. he had a head injury and two people were overboard. We're like, so we're flying out there, and in the newspaper article, it says that Hoffmaster was getting queasy in the back. No, I was puking in my helmet bag. That wasn't queasy, man. I was just, because in the 65, <laughs> you're just getting tossed around. So you're, you're hoping the mech doesn't look back. You're, you know, you're air like, sick as shit. That's awesome. <laughs> it <was> horrible, dude. <laughs> horrible. I'm puking. Looking out, it was like 30, 35 footsies. It, I'm thinking, I holy crap. I kind of didn't want to get in there, but then I'm thinking, at least I won't be sick. So we're flying out there and the winds were like 65, 67 knot winds. And as the article says, uh, with a tailwind, we were going 200 miles an hour in the, in the dolphin flying out there. So we searched and searched, but another crew go out with us. They actually landed for fuel and the flight mech said, I'm done. He, he put his car down and said, no, nah, we're not going. Cause you know, one of the crew members says, I'm not, I don't feel safe. You're pretty much done. So right. they stayed at the airport and they didn't leave. We're still, they asked us and we're like, no, we're good. Let's go. You know, I'm like wiping the vomit off my mouth. Like, yeah, let's go. Uh, uh, I'm, good. I'm good. I'm good, coach. Put me in, coach. That is exactly <laughs> it. Never quit, right? Don't quit. Uh. So we searched and searched. They had a C-130 came out there and everything. It wound up being a hoax call. Oh, lame. It was horrible. And they found that out because they did a lot of investigations. And the reason that they still flew on it is because a year before or something, the Coast Guard didn't respond to one. They got a call and they heard somebody laughing in the background. So they, they equated it with, well, okay, this is a hoax call because you can clearly hear the people laughing. It was clearly a hoax call. Yeah. But what they didn't know was that someone else had been calling, but they put them together. So they thought, oh, these are just all, you know, the same one. They didn't go. Well, that was a bad call because uh, they found him later. It was a father and son had died. Oh, Both bummer. Died. Yeah. So that was the year before. So whenever they got a call, it was, we're going. Yeah. We're going to go check it out. And that was, that was, uh, that was a pretty rough night. But again, it was, it was one of those exciting things that I did. And, but I didn't even get wet for that one. And then again, of course, uh, perfect storm happened when I was up there. So the perfect storm, perfect like storm the, happened, right? Actually, actually, pretty decent movie that they made out of the book. Um, the only bad thing about the movie, though, is that the movie was incorrect, but the book was right. Correct. Yeah, and so now, you know that. Yeah. So for everybody else, it doesn't. So in the book, it's actually a Coast Guard uh, that goes out, not the National Guard. So the National Guard went out, and they they did deploy a guy, which never. Got found, but it was the Coast Guard that went out to the sailboat, not the National right. Guard. Dave Moore was a swimmer. Yeah, Dave Moore. So, you know, the, the PJ that 
one of the PJs, because it's kind of neat because we got stationed at Gabreski when I was in Atlantic City, we had a detachment and I got to meet uh, Joe, Dave Rivola, who was the pilot that night. He was the one that put it in. So we, it was up at that Air National Guard base. So we got to talk to him about it. And Rick Smith's, Rick Smith was the PJ who jumped out at like, I guess they say like 150 feet because it was nighttime. They had their black wetsuits on, no yeah. reflected, you know. And uh, he jumped out and I guess he's the only one they didn't find. So we searched for him. I was on the search for that. And that was horrible, man. Just looking for this guy, knowing he's a, a PJ, he's out there. And it was just, it, it was it was tough, but it was really kind of neat to be able to talk to the pilot after that. Yeah. Um, so anyways, there's more to that story about Rick Smith. His Both his daughters joined the Air National Guard after oh, that. That's they, awesome. Yeah, in, in honor of their dad. And I think they didn't become PJs, I don't think, but they went through Air National Guard and they were serving just in honor of their dad. It was just crazy. Wow, that's yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. So that's, other than, you know, I had a lot of cases in Brooklyn, um, mostly medevacs, but nothing ever equated to, you know, the, the big case up there, but I was, wow. it was very, very busy, which was better than almost like one or two big cases. Your duty nights were almost always filled. So, yeah. Oh, you know, Olaf actually talks about that too. I, I didn't, I never had the experience to, to fly in New York, but I, everybody I've talked to says it was busy. Um, it, it was I, just, I worked with the pilot, Robert DeCoopman, and he flew out of New York. He said it was busy as well. So I, yeah, you fly like just any kind of flight you're flying down, through Manhattan, your, your pilots are, keep your head on a swivel. And you're just, you're flying down Manhattan. You're like, uh, two o'clock, uh, there's one. <laughs> <laughs> air traffic all over. It was it's everywhere. Insane, but it was also one of the coolest things. I mean, the air station was great. The shop was great. Uh, it was, I mean, we only had, well, we had four 65s. That was it. So it was just, it was, it was great. Rolling, rolling um, hard. Man, yeah. that's, that's killer. Yeah. So then I, uh, then we came down to Corpus. Yep. Which was kind of cool because Lavelle came down to Corpus also. So, you know, I was there down here with him. And um, so in Corpus, we had a lot of oil rigs. And I know you talked to Al Yates. Oh, yeah. And, and Olaf. And Olaf. And, yep. And I, I hate oil rigs. God, I hated them. You know, they put you on there. Like they'd land on one tier of it. And then you had to go down all these flights of stairs to this little bunk room to get the guy out who just probably just wanted to go home because he was tired. Yeah. He has backpack and everything. And you're walking on this, on these grades. I'm sure you do that now, right? You, you get, you've been on your yeah. share of oil. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you're just looking down going, wow. And I remember carrying some like 300 pound guy in the, uh, not the whole Stokes, just the Miller body board yep. to get him to there. And going around these tight corners with like a 90 degree turn, you're like, oh my God. But you got to be cool. You got you to gotta like be the tough guy in charge. Of, like, oh, this is what we're going to do. We're going to. Meanwhile, you're going, oh, my God, I'm going to fall off this thing. Is there a safety it's clip somewhere? Can I, can I clip in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, we did a lot. I did a lot of, you know, oil rigs and, and, and that. And then one of my really good cases down there, which um, it's it was a uh, Hurricane Rosa came through. And so I was in Corpus and it came through and it. It came through and up through the Lavaca River, and it was a, it was a pretty big storm. It caused the paper said it caused about twenty deaths overall. Wow! So we fly out to this farm. There's two people apparently stranded in this farmhouse. So they lower me down. Right, I'm looking like holy crap. I mean, the, the water was up to the windows. It was it was high. They lower me down to the roof, and like the horrible coasty I was that month, I guess. I didn't put enough silicone on my PRC 90 antenna. Okay. Uh, you, so, did you ever deal with PRC 90? I, only for like a minute. Like we went to this gray, I don't even remember the name of it, but it was a like gray radio after the PRC 90 because the PRC 90 big freaking honking metal thing. And you clap click, test to make yeah, sure it work. Click, click. I'll find it. Click, <laughs> click. There's it, only like three, three uh, channels on the whole damn thing. <laughs> yep. So they put me on the roof. I take my rubber band off. So my antenna goes ding and it goes ding and, and it pops off. I in my hands still, I'm like, Oh my God. And so our communication I'm, is now lost. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm on the roof holding this, holding the antenna onto it so I can still talk. Right. And I can still get through them, but 
<laughs> so <laughs> I, I basically, I'm, I'm looking around knocking on windows because I'm on the second level. And I look around and I hear some guy on the bottom. So I slide to the edge of the roof. And like I said, the water's up probably five feet, four or five feet. And I'm looking, I'm like, look, I'm going to jump down into your yard, which is the, the ocean now. <laughs> or I said, is there anything down there? Is there, he's like, no, no, you're good. I'm like, no, like, is there a bush there? There, is there a, a, anything? He's like, no, you're good. So I jump off and uh, I go over and it's like a 40 year old farmhand. So the owners left, only people there were the farmhands, the workers there. So you had a four, like a 40 year old farmhand. And as I come in the house, there's the other guy who's the senior guy. He's like 80 years old. Okay. So I walk in the house. And I look at him and the water's up to his, you know, about his knees. He's naked. The 80 year old guy's buck naked. I'm like, oh, hey, 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 how sir, you doing? Uh, we're we're going to get you out of here. And he just, Have you he got a pair of pants? He did. They were draped over his arm. He was oh, the, 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 trying to keep him dry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, I'm gonna just going to keep these dry for a minute. <laughs> just some old cowboy. Like, I'm not getting my pants wet. So I'm like, I'll deal with that later, right? Oh, so that's great. What we're going to do is, the you know, uh, I think at that point, the heel had to leave and go get fuel. So I'm talking to these guys, and they said, we're not leaving until we let the cattle and horses out. Because they were, in, they were in cages. I'm like, oh, God, God. How do you say no to that? I'm like, ah. They're like, we're not going to leave. So uh, the heel comes back, and I you know, hold my antenna to my radio. And I say, Hey, here's the deal. I told him, I said, it, it's right over there. Uh, and I said, all right, do what you got to do. So I go with the farmhand and I think they lowered the strop down. So I just had the strop and I disconnected it. So I had him holding the strop and me holding the strop. I said, all right, we're going to walk. We're going to let these out as much as we can. And, uh, then we're going to get the hell out of here. He's like, all right, all right. So we're walking and I mean, we're in, we're in trees were like bushes. They, they were right in line. Yeah. And he was telling me, all right, just keep your eye out for water moccasins and, and alligators. I'm like, what? You're what? You're what? like I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought we were letting livestock out. Not yeah. Like, He's like worried well, about my life. <laughs> he said, he said, well, cause a couple of days ago we saw a pretty big alligator on the land over here. This was in like, I think it was Edna, Texas. Oh my God. It's right, pretty much right between Houston and Corpus. Yeah. So I'm walking. I'm trying to be a tough guy, you know, like, all right, we got, you know, we'll, we'll get this. Let them, let them out of here. So as we're walking, there's dead cattle. You know, some of the cattle had been drowned, so they're laying over. And I'm like, this is horrible. And as we're walking, I bump something with my foot. I hit something. And I'm like, <gasps> you did one of those? And he goes, no, no, that's just a spout. And you could look, the spouting came down and went out there. So I'm thinking it's an alligator feeding on a, on a calf and my legs in the way. So I'm like, Oh, whew, whew. and he's not scared one bit. He's just, well, all right, we'll go, you know, keep walking. So we walk, I'm looking for snakes and bushes and trees and everything. And it was sad. We got there and we opened the gate and some of the horses were able to get out and go to, you know, get to higher land. I don't know if they succeeded and made it that far, but the cattle got out and, so it's kind of a cool feeling to let all them out, right? Yeah. And then I'm telling them, okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to get back kind of close to the house and then we're going to get away from the trees and we're going to, I'm going to hoist you. I'm going to hoist the, the other gentleman then I'll hoist you. And he's like, in the helicopter? And he was afraid to go in the helicopter. And I'm like, you weren't scared of alligators and all this stuff, but you're afraid to get in the helicopter. So we kind of made a joke about it. But then I went into the house and I told the guy, sir, you're going to have to put some pants on before we hoist you. I'm going to put you in a basket and it's not going to be comfortable if you're naked. <laughs> so he did, he got dressed and successful hoist, you know, we got out of there. It was, I was there for quite a while. And so we get out of there, go home. Nothing was ever said about it. Meanwhile, you had Marty Nelson and I think it was Rob McClure. Okay. Got called up from Corpus to go to Houston to help out. This is where I get a little bitter. And they, they flew all around, did nothing, but they threw, threw, flew 
through possible cyanide poisoning. So they had to <laughs> land and everything. It never equated to that. It never was, but they're like, oh, because because all these gas things up in Houston were were blown up, you know, yeah. blood and everything. So I remember like a couple of weeks later at, at our muster, they get called out and they got LOCs for flying and that stuff. Not one mention of my case. <laughs> I didn't let livestock out. I was I was scared for my life because of alligators and water moccasins. Does anyone have any idea? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> And I remember going, oh, man. and that was pretty much, you know, that was pretty much my career. I know that people were like, oh, we should have did this. And then a while later, I remember flying with the pilots and we landed down in uh, Port Lavaca getting fuel. And I remember we had the same pilot that I had. And he goes, yeah, remember that case? I should have put us in for something for that, huh? I'm like, yeah, because at that time it was important for your service wide. Yeah, yeah. You needed like points and stuff to advance and because all that, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it all counted, right? Yeah. So, but I, I advanced fine without it. I mean, I, I did pretty well advancing without the points. So so that was uh, my Houston case. That was my big case down there. And uh, again, we had a lot of medevacs and all our rigs. Yep. And then it was back to Brooklyn. I love Brooklyn so much. I went back to Brooklyn. Love and, it. Yeah. So Brooklyn, and then that's the point you're talking about where they closed Cape May and Brooklyn. So I was at Brooklyn for one year, and then we consolidated in Atlantic City. Uh, remind me, what year was that? Uh, we closed Brooklyn in 1998. Okay. So, yeah. So 1998. I was, we I was in, so at that time, I was, um, I was in Washington, D.C., and that's, that's why I remember it, because when I was in boot camp, the air station was still there. And then while oh, I okay. was in D.C., that was the big talk, because they were talking about sending – like the honor guard up there to do a big opening ceremony and the whole yes. nine yards. And yeah. yeah, it was a huge thing, man. It was, yeah. it was pretty cool being part of a, a new air station like that, but it, it was kind of dumb because even though we went there, we still had to have an attachment in New York on long Island. Right. So, so we're like, it, you're up there all the time anyway. <laughs> yeah. Every, every, you'd go up there for two weeks. So year round we had a detachment, which in hindsight was really cool because you got deployed. You're going to the Hamptons to get deployed. For two yeah. weeks, that was it was rough. Rough. Was really, yeah, <laughs> we lived in trailers, but other than that, we we'd go into this, you know, into the town, work out, and Ferraris and Lamborghinis all over the place in the Hamptons. It was, it was, it was pretty rough. Tell yeah. my wife, I gotta go. Yeah. gotta go to Hamptons, honey. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, hon. <laughs> so, anyways, Atlantic City, and then from you know, I had not too many cases there or anything, but another another great group of guys. Uh, yep. Scott Holloway, John Williams, all those guys. Oh, so, great, great. That's what all the air stations great was, was the people you were with, you know? Right. So. Yeah, when you have a good shop, like I, I, all the shops I went to where I, I loved all the guys I worked with. So it yeah. is, it, there's a different dynamic to each shop. And, and every year when transfer happens, the shop changes just a little bit, but there's a whole dynamic new dynamic. Change, yeah. And, you know, like at one point, like I remember in Humble, we were playing racquetball all the time. And then the next time we're playing, you know, or the next year, all of a sudden we're on to volleyball or something else. And you're yeah, like, yeah, oh, hey. yeah, you try something new. I remember like, yeah. I remember hearing about volleyball. I'm like, yeah, that's stupid. Who the hell yeah. would ever play volleyball? Like I play volleyball. I'm not playing. Well, well then you meet a group of people like, this is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> why, why don't, why haven't we been doing this the whole time? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's and then, cool. uh, then I made, I, I made the cut for chief and then I went to Cape Cod. So, and the kind of the cool thing that I'm pretty happy about my career, every time I transferred, I transferred as a, the next higher step. Oh, nice. Good for you. Yeah. So that kind of, except for, of course, the Brooklyn to Atlantic city, but that was just a closure and a thing. But, yeah. but every time I went to a new unit, it was, it was advanced. Uh, an advancement. So it was kind of tough when I got to Cape Cod because here I am a, a chief. I made chief in 14 years and I walk into Cape Cod and there's Troy Jewett. Buck Beaudry, Chuck <laughs> Carter, someone else. All these guys with years and years and years of being a second and first class. And, and I'm not saying that in a bad way. They, they had so much experience and they just right. didn't test. Yes. And they've had so many cases under them, you know, they're like two air medals here and a DFC. And I'm like, well, you know, okay. So you're um, walking into a shop to put this in perspective for everybody that has as the higher ranking guy. So you have the rank but they have the years in and experience 
past yep. you, but they have to listen to you because you have the rank. Exactly. Right. Listen, exactly. you punks. <laughs> so I, I got what Steve Ober told me when I was a third class, when, when I met him, he said, Hey, when I was leaving, I remember he said, so take, he said, cause we didn't always see eye to eye, Steve, Steve Ober and I, he would, you know, he would tell jokes and all the guys in the shop would laugh all the time. But if I didn't think it was funny, I wouldn't laugh. I just, and he would see that with me and he'd be like, like I was a little different, but I respect the hell out of him. And uh, he told me, he said, so when you leave and as you become a leader, he said, take the good points that you like from me and use them. He said, everything I do that you don't like, throw it out and do that with every supervisor and leader you have, and you'll build a good leader. And that's I like what that. I, I, I tried to do, right? So yeah. when I get to Cape Cod, I, I, basically, I basically told these guys, look, I, I understand the situation here. I understand how you guys are. The shop's going to run. I'm not going to come in and change things around like most shop chiefs did. Okay, we're going to do this now. Which, yeah. If it's running right, let's keep it going. I, I listened to them. You know, I, 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 they knew what they were doing. You know, these guys were seasoned pros. Yeah. So I'd say we got, a, you know, we had a really great shop. And uh, I really didn't, I stood duty, but I didn't, if a case came up, I was going to give it up. Like, hey, you guys want this case, you want this case. Um, so when Katrina came up, um, it was kind of, we got kind of different people in that time, but one of our guys was one of the first ones down there, which was, uh, Matt Odell. Nice. Matt Odell went down there and then I sent a couple more swimmers. And finally I'm like, well, you know what? I kind of want a little fun in this. I, I, I want to see this. So, and the CEO at the time actually told me, he said, Hey man, I need you to go down there. You know, he, he was Tom Ostaba was his name. Very hyper guy. And, uh, he, he basically wanted me to go. So I, I, I went down there and I'm glad I did. Cause it was, it kind of summed up your whole career going to see that like, the, wow, this is well, crazy. And there you earned yourself a meritorious service medal from that. Yes. So, yes. which is pretty awesome. And, and if you're all right with that, I'd like to actually read that, uh, because it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, sure. sure. All right. So I, I'll tell you what, so we get right to it and then we'll kind of, uh, we'll hammer down into the, the logistics of it because, and the reason, uh, which is nice about this one is, you know, we've talked to a couple of guys that, that did Katrina and whatnot, or that were there for it and worked it, but you had a different role in here, uh, because you were going down as a chief. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that. And then obviously some of the rescues that, you know, you had, cause you did stand duty. You did fly even as a chief, uh, for Katrina. So anyway, Citation to accompany the award of the Meritorious Service Medal to Harold H. Hoffmaster, Chief Aviation Survival Technician, United States Coast Guard. Chief Petty Officer Hoffmaster is cited for meritorious service and performance of duty as rescue swimmer supervisor at Air Station New Orleans from 01 September 2005 to 06 September 2005 during Hurricane Katrina response operations. Upon his arrival to Air Station New Orleans from his duty station in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, he immediately assumed responsibility for all rescue swimmer operations and maintenance duties, allowing local Air Station personnel to focus on their personal hardships resulting from the loss of their homes and the evacuations of their families. Demonstrating remarkable leadership, he organized a massive and individual chaotic influx of more than 20 rescue swimmers from nine air stations into a cohesive force that provided an effective and suitable around-the-clock rescue effort. He supervised the initial repair of the storm-ravaged hangar facilities, clearing water and debris to save tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. As a critical incident stress management counselor, he personally conducted post-flight debriefings with every rescue swimmer to mitigate the effect of physiological effects of firsthand exposure and distributing scale of human suffering resulting from one of the largest natural disasters in U.S. history. In addition to his immense successful efforts on the ground, Chief Hoffmaster personally saved over 20 lives while deploying his rescue swimmer, often called upon for on-the-spot innovation and reached survivors trapped in flood waters. He ingeniously gained access to cutoff areas, often using an axe, to chop through roofs to rescue survivors. 
On several occasions, when basket hoists were impossible, he was forced to employ a physical grip method, literally holding the survivors in his arms to safely complete the rescues. Both in flight and on the ground, he was an instrumental leader in the rescue operations that saved over 11,000 lives. Chief Hoffmaster's dedication and devotion to duty are most heartily commended in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Coast Guard. Harold, oh my gosh. <laughs> so, I mean, and, and this is what I'm talking about. Like, you went down there as the leader. So, they threw you right into the blades by, I mean, you're herding cats. I mean, we're a bunch of swimmers. We're, we're ready for the fight. Throw us in, you know, and, and you have to corral yeah. everybody and say, whoa, 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 whoa. We got to do this organized. So, get, but yeah, that, that, that little... kind of made it easy though, because there was, there was never a time you're having to tell somebody to do something. Oh, totally. You know, like, it was you. The hard part was telling people, "No, no, you reached your limit. You need to take a break. <laughs> it's not your turn." Because come on, coach, had, put me in. Oh, I'm not done yet. Huge, yeah, they had a huge uh, uh, whiteboard there with all the names and everything, and it was and and you know the master chief over there and everything. They, they were really controlling that. You know. They, so, anyways, I got there and they sent me over right away. They sent me over. I flew over there and uh, I got there and Jeff Demata was there. And he looked tired. He, he, he still wanted to fly and he was still taking care of his guys, but he was exhausted. And I got there and I was saying, hey, man, you know, I'm here to give you a break. Go home, take care of your things and, 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 and relax, get some sleep and then come back. No, I'm not going. And he was really adamant that he did not want to leave. I'm not leaving my guys. I'm like, look, and, and we knew each other a little bit, but yeah. when you're shop chief, those are your guys, right? You're like, he didn't know me well enough to, to put him in his hands. And so we got to talk in and, and he eventually went and, and then his guys had to leave too. And I, 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 I think Kirk Peterson, if I remember, he was one of those guys, he was one of those seasoned guys too. He was kind of tough to, he was kind of fight, not fighting me, but you could tell he, he didn't want to leave and give it up. So, which, which I completely understood. So, yeah. so they did leave. And, uh, um, basically what I was told my job, I, I remember sitting in the hangar. There was no power. We were running by generators. I was sitting in the hangar and the plate, the heels would pull up because there was two lanes. One was the heel would come in. And if it was, uh, you know, good, not broken. It would go in this lane. They'd fuel it up and bring it around to the, the front of the hangar and load them up and go. And the other one was, you know, need maintenance. So they would go the other way. So these swimmers would get off the helo. And basically I was looking for that thousand mile stare when they come out, like, Oh, oh my God, like overwhelmed from what they saw. Yeah. And to be honest with you, not many of them had that. I mean, you could tell they saw some stuff, but it wasn't to the point where it was going to affect their, their performance. They were just so like, they called it down there, the super bowl of SAR. Yeah. It was, everybody was so pumped up. So, like I said, the hardest part was telling people, no, nah, man, you, you, you're, I know you're not at six hours of flight time yet, but you've done a lot. You got to go. So you take a break and then we, we, you know, sort people around and it was pretty incredible. Just sitting there. I remember I fell asleep in a, in a chair in just one of the hanger chairs and I remember waking up and there was a C-130 out there. It just scared the crap out of me. Like, <gasps> it, right in front of the hangar. Yeah. Bringing more supplies in. So another hard part was the media would show up. So we have all these young guys telling these stories, you know, like, oh, dude, you should have seen this. And, you know, <laughs> this floater here doing this and this. Per and having to tell them, hey, we need to tone it down a little bit because this is devastating to the area. Right. And they're going to put the camera on us and we're goofing off and laughing. And it's hard for people to explain to, to explain to people that this is what we live for. This is you want us to be stoked and happy and ready to go. This yeah. is, this is One so, person total demise and day ruined is our the can't wait to get out there. So excited that it's happening. And yes. it's such an, an opposite. It's, it's hard to fathom when you're not yeah. in it, you know. And we've yeah. all, it's, it's, I'll put it in, in perspective that everybody can understand is that, you know, you get in a car crash. The last thing you want to have happen in a car crash is you to be in the car crash, you know, but at the same time, 
the firefighters right there, they're like Jones in the go. They're they're yeah. Jones in to help you. And that's that's how we that's how we feel. I mean, that's that's that's, yeah. the, that's the easiest way to put it in perspective for anybody that's listening. It, it's that personality, that mindset. Like I remember having to tell an warrant officer one time because he was complaining about how obnoxious the swimmers were. I said, Well, you don't want a swimmer sitting in a door that's timid going, ah, I don't, I don't really want to go out in those seas. You want somebody that's gonna say, move yeah I'm coming get out of my way yes, let me do was, let me go do my job it's my so turn it was it, it was great down there getting to 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 get with those guys you know i remember the one day they actually got us pizza for some somehow they got us pizza and it was like whoa hallelujah uh, yeah so then uh a couple days later whatever uh marty nelson had came down and me and marty were stationed together many times we knew each other and he had just made chief so he came down and and he pretty much he he uh, got with the guys and I, they rearranged the hangar to make it, you know, more efficient and everything. I was just, my whole thought was like, let's get you rest, get you fed and get you back out there. So, yeah. but luckily I was able to still hop on a couple flights and get out there. And it was nothing you've ever seen before. It was just incredible. When you pick people up, they didn't want to go, of course. And I'm sure you've heard these stories many, many times. You, you tell them like, hey, let's go get your stuff. Like, no, no, I, I just want water. Just give me water. We're going to stay here. Like, no, you don't understand. No one's coming for you. When I leave, no one's coming for you. And it's not going to be a day or two. And finally, you convince some people to leave. And when, once they get hoisted and they sit in the, in the helo and they look around at the entire city yeah. underwater, then they got it. Like, oh, you know, they, they thought it was their, their area. That's it. But yeah. it was the entire city. So um, we flew around and, and most of them were balconies, lowering us to balconies. And like many of people said before, the coolest thing was, is I didn't know my pilot. I didn't know my co-pilot and I didn't know my flight mechanic. Right. Met, met him for the very first time. Got in the helo. He, I feel horrible. I don't remember his name, but there was a couple of different ones. Lower me to these balconies that were so tight and just, Con, getting conning me in and, and putting me perfectly there and getting these people out. It was, it was incredible. There was no, there was no fear that they were going to hurt me. Yeah. Know, Precision hoisting. Like it was just incredible. You know, um, I, I actually, John Hall actually mentions that in the movie, the guardian, as they're talking, like, yes. you know, they're in school and they're like, you know, when he went down, uh, it's so true. And that is such a discussion on standards and standardization and keeping everything the same across the board. Yes. Can't emphasize it enough. It's so for all those, all those young swimmers out there that can't stand when the stand team comes, there's a reason for that. Yeah. There's a reason that, that it's so monotonous that over and over and over again. Yeah. And that, that's how I did. I, so at one point there was these, these balconies. It was so weird because you had these high rises and the balconies were just basically a slab uh, of cement, concrete slab sticking out, no railings around them or anything. It was, it's really weird. So they lowered me down. And I remember there was a man, a woman and two children. So I don't know why this happened, but I remember grabbing the guy first and his child. So I got him in the, I, I hoist, you know, we got him hoisted, got him up there uneventful. Yeah. Um, but it was weird, like holding someone and then their child. So you're holding two people. They were in the strop, though. I think I did with the strop. Then I got the mom, who was a pretty large lady, and she had an infant. And when I grabbed her, it was mostly a physical grip because I think she slipped out of the strop. And I remember having to squeeze my legs together, my arms together so tight. And I remember yelling in her ear, just, just hold on to your baby. So she was in between me and her, the baby was in between me and her. And I just squeezed the hell out of him, you know, probably hurt him, but I just squeezed him so tight. And as the helo, as I came off the ledge, you know, for some reason we started taking off. It was like a pendulum. I'm like, what the, what? Yeah. I had no idea, but we took off and come to find out when I get in the helo, they had a torque split. Oh. 65. So they had to hit, transition to forward flight. Yeah. So, we're swinging a little bit, but they got us up in there. And, and I, I never remember holding on so tight to somebody like that. And uh, thinking, please don't drop him. Please don't drop him. Please don't drop him. And <laughs> the feeling of when you 
get in the cab and you're like, oh God, thank God, thank God. Thank yeah. God. So I did that with a couple of people. Um, a lot of it was going to the rooftops. One, I remember going to rooftop and it was packed and people weren't happy. So I remember thinking, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? People were getting angry. So I went up to this guy in a white tank top. Looked like he was the toughest guy there. And they're like, we're going, we're going, you know, and like yelling at me. And I just went to him. I said, hey man, I said, I need your help. No one's gonna listen to me. You know, I had lifted my helmet up talking to him because you kept your helmet on yeah. because you didn't want to get hit in the head. People right. had got hit in the head. So I yelling at him like, look, you, you're the leader here, obviously. No one's going to listen to me. Can you help me? I want to get women and children, blah, blah, blah. So he kind of looked at me funny and then he did. And he actually took the lead. Wow. And he organized people for us. So I'm just standing there with the basket, putting people in the basket and then that feeling of when just the hook comes down, that's the scary part because that's the heel. Cause I was in 65s. Right. So we get like four or five people and the hook comes down and you're like, Oh crap, this means it's time for me to go. And everyone's going to get pissed off. So that's what happens. And, and you try to tell people, look, there's a heel right behind it. They're going to come in and keep getting you. But it was almost like you had to escape out of there. The hook comes down, you go. And they're looking at you like, what are you doing? You know, it was yeah. a horrible feeling leave people behind right not knowing if you broke up families or not so wow um rescued a few dogs you know people wouldn't leave without their dogs i'm like hell yeah bring your dog let's go um leaning over rooftops you know yeah i still had a little fear of heights so instead Wait, of like i'm sorry you have, you have a fear of heights <laughs> not from a heel of perspective right oh, okay if, just check if it. i'm on a tall like, building by myself and I'm looking over. I don't know if someone's going to come behind me. So I'm like on my, on my belly, leaning over like, all right, I'm going to get low. <laughs> Same guy in the helicopter that's looking down at 15 feet, like bring this sucker up a little higher. Give me like 20, 25. Yeah. Let's make this show nice. Yeah. So, <laughs> a little scared of heights here, sir. Can we, can we bring... <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. So, oh, that, that's that, great. that worked out good. We got a lot of people. And I remember going back in uh, after my case and going into the ops room and talking to the, uh, I guess the ops officer there. And I don't think he really listened to me, but what I told him, I said, Hey, I said, if there's any way you can talk to your pilots, well, this happened to me that they saw some people on the balcony and they said, we're going to land over here. And I want you to go through all that water, climb up there and get them and then walk them through. And luckily I was a chief at the time. Yeah. As if I was the third, I would be like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But as a chief, I said, no, nah, sorry. I said, you can, you can hoist me to that building. I don't want to walk that water. That's disgusting. Just yeah. hoist me. To that and they did. They listened to me. So I told the that right that. there, my friend, is experience. Yes. Because, yes. You know, and I actually I remember a story and I'm, I'm going to come back to this for a minute. But I remember a story. Uh, I wish I could. Remember. I think it was Scott Dyer who was talking about it. And there was a young swimmer, third class, like just out of school, just qualified, swimming through the surf like four or five times, say people. And Scotty's like, man, pick me up. move, <laughs> Let the helicopter do the work for me. Yes. Like I. Why do I have to swim through the breakers six or seven times when I have a helicopter to move me? This right here is exactly the same scenario yeah. with just shitty ass water that nobody should be walking in. I was vile too, man. It was so bad. It was disgusting. He used just, a helicopter to do the advantage. You know? Yeah. So he did. And, and you know, we, we hoisted the people. And I'm, when I got back and we debriefed a little bit, I went into the ops room. Cause every once in a while I'd go into the ops room and see what's going on, listen to the cases. And uh, I remember telling, telling them, and I, I don't think they listened to me very, probably very much. Cause like, whatever, it's a hurricane, it's a flood. I said, if you can, I, if you can tell the, your pilots, if there's any way to not put the swimmers in the water, that would be great because we don't know what's going to come out of this. We, we don't know what diseases or, or infections these guys are going to get. Right. Right. We were told not to shave. What was the thing is don't shave. Yeah. No cuts. You didn't want any cuts. Like accidentally right. cut your face. Now all of a sudden you have an open wound going into that yeah. nasty water. So I tried, but I, I don't, I don't know if they listened to me or not, but they might've told some pilots, but you know, they're the young swimmers were, if you just told them, Hey, go in there. I'll go. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go. You know, and they did. A lot of them did. And, and at, at some points you had to, of, of course, yeah. there were no options. And I would have as well, if I had to, Yeah. but you have to use your experience and look around and be like, mm, let's work smarter. Right. So. So that was my Katrina stories, man. That's pretty good. Again, to come back to it though, is it 
you know, you had a group of people. You didn't go down there as just one of the guys jumping on the aircraft. You were going down there to lead, you know, and uh, it's, it's like we needed guys like you down there at that time. So I appreciate kudos. it. But like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't too hard to lead them because they were just motivated were just to go. To go. Oh, man. Yeah. It, I mean, that's <laughs> the thing about this raid is there's great guys that are willing to do it. Yeah. So that was my big case. Um, and uh, then after that, it was, uh, I had two more cases. I just had a 63 year old guy that was in the heavy surf. And it was kind of cool thing about that is I had a Falcon flying around during this and they took video and still pictures of, of me going in the water for that case. And it was, so the guy was on the jetty with his wife and they'd been married for years and years. There's an anniversary. So they went to the jetties and he got wa swapped, uh, washed off. This Where, off what, of, is this out of Cape Cod still? Yeah, it's Cape Cod. This okay. is off of Point Judith. Point Judith? Off of Point Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So again, that was, I think that was another SAR demo we were going for. And it turned into a case. That's why we got there so quick. And as we get there, it, it was like, a, I don't know, 150, 200 yards off the, off the jetties. And it's, if you're not familiar with Point Judith, it's pretty rocky up there. There's, it's, Rocks it's rough. Everywhere. So he got tossed off. We get there and there's a boat, but the boat couldn't get in close enough. So it was too shallow and like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, actually, no, I'm not, it wasn't a star case. This was a stand check. The stand team was there. Oh, so, even better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I had a, they, they put me in and I was getting tossed around in there because the waves were just beating the crap out of us. I finally reached the, the gentleman and I turned him over and his face was all beat up. He hit the, he was smashed into the rocks Ouch! and he wasn't breathing. So I'm trying to breathe from a little bit, but then in my head, I'm thinking, wait, if he just got smashed into the rocks, they're right around me. Yeah. Yeah. So, and again, he was naked. So that's the second naked guy. But he was, you know, the, apparently the, it was so rough. It washed his shorts, his uh, bathing suit off. So I put him in the basket. They hoist him up. And it was, I find out it was a horrible feeling later because his wife was on the jetty still watching all this transpire. So, and, and then actually there's a crowd kind of gathered around there who was watching it. So we got him in the basket, uh, did CPR on him on the way home, but obviously he didn't make it. Yeah. So that one kind of bothered me a little bit because he was, his wife was right there yeah, and, and I couldn't bring it back, but I couldn't really do it. I mean, he hit his head pretty hard. His face was pretty mangled up from hitting the rocks, but, um, and then that I had one more case after that before I retired. And that was the night before St. Patrick's day, which was, uh, pretty crazy. We went out there and we didn't know, uh, it was the fishing vessel Celtic pride pretty much on St. Patty's day on St. Patty's day, Celtic on road, St. Yeah. Patty's day. <laughs> <laughs> so we get out there. Luck of the uh, Irish maybe, or luck of the Irish. The boat sank. <laughs> not <laughs> luck of the Irish. <laughs> no, no. And come to find out one of the guys in the boat, this is the second time he's been on a boat that sank on a fishing boat that sank within two years. So oh, hmm. he was not That's, a lucky guy. Well, he, in one sense he was because he survived. learned how to survive. Yeah. So we're flying out there. It's, you know, 2 30, 3 30 in the morning. We fly out there. Now I'm, this is 2006. I'm retiring in 2007. So I'm a little more seasoned now, right? I'm flying out there. Waves are pretty bad. It's, it, it's pretty rough. Again, they're, they're, they said it was 20 foot waves, waves. And uh, the, I didn't get, you know, I'm not one to get big medals as you've seen, but this was a Coast Guard accommodation medal. And the way that read up was, uh, they were flying through a snow squall and very low visibility and it was 120 miles off. So we're low on fuel. So we're getting out there. And what am I thinking? I'm thinking instead of my first case, like don't let that boat get there. I'm thinking, Oh, where's that boat? Can the boat get to him? <laughs> Please let the boat get there first. I'm feeling like doing this. <laughs> like I'm, Man, it's three o'clock in the morning. We're low on fuel. They're gonna leave me behind. Oh man, this is how it's gonna end. So I know most members wouldn't say that. You know, they're like, "Oh yeah, I'm, oh it's ready to go." But I'm thinking, 
oh man, this is how it's going to end. I'm so close to just being to retirement. <laughs> so, <This is> yeah. <laughs> so we get out there and uh, uh, they, we talked about it and they're in a raft. So these three guys are in a raft. They had a, the EPIRBs with us. They called everything in. This guy was, like I said, it wasn't his first rodeo. He, uh, he knew what to do. He had the guys don their, their suits. They had their suits on and everything. So Mr. Bouchard, who was one of our exchange pilots from Canada, he was like, look, we're low on fuel. So I'm like, direct deploy me. Yeah. Just He's like, well, I'll try. He said, but if, if, if it starts to get too much and we're going to tip the raft over, then I'm going to have to deploy you. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. But let's try direct deployment just to get them up and out of here quick. Yeah. Cause like I said, they were all in their suits. So it wasn't like they were, they were safe to a point. So in a uh, real quick for direct deployment. For those that don't know is we stay attached to the hook. This is coast guard rescue swimmer model is you stay attached to the hook. You'll get down within an arm's reach length of your survivor or victim. You grab them, you pull them in, you throw them in a quick drop, ready for pickup, and then boom, you picked up right out of the water. So that is the direct deployment Coast Guard method that he's referring to. Yes. So I got the first guy, hoisted him up, you know, went up with him, put him in the cabin. The second guy, I get out of the raft, he freaks out a little bit and he grabs me and takes me under. Oh, which again, it sounds dramatic, but. I'm in my dry suit. He's in a suit. We're not going to stay under for very long. You know, he's just right. aggressive. Grabs me. So I calm him down and I get him in the basket. And then the third hey, guy. Just out of curiosity, who won that battle? <laughs> I did. <laughs> Damn right you did. Damn right I did. You're getting a fight with a rescue <laughs> swimmer in the water? I guess he's going to win that one. You're going to lose every time. That's like an oh. untrained <laughs> MMA guy or stepping into a ring with an MMA guy. Who's going to win that fight? Oh. Uh... Yeah. yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Then the third guy was the season guy and I get him in the basket and it's so weird because you don't know how big people oh, are. Sorry, in the basket? So now you've... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. I'm not in the basket. I get him out of the raft Oh yeah. and we get hoisted up. Okay. And as, when you're in the water, you don't realize how big they are. Yeah. As we get hoisted, I'm like, holy crap. This guy was big. He was, I don't know, 6'5", maybe. He was just huge. I'm 5'8". So, <laughs> so we get hoisted up. He's dangling way down there and I'm... <laughs> So we get him in and uh, treat him for hypothermia. You know, we got back to the station. It was really cool because it was whatever, you know, I don't know what time in the morning, but the ops boss, the XO, they met us on the tarmac. They came out and, and met us there. It was so cool. It was, it wow. Was really, yeah. Oh, that's Tom Kudos Maine to the command. Out. Yeah. Tom Maine. He retired as Captain Maine. He was one of the best pilots I've ever had. So oh. he came out and did all this. So that... Um, so that was pretty cool. So to sum this one up, um, a couple weeks later, I'm getting ready to go home. Labo, Brian Lobenstein is Love the guy. incoming Love duty. Lobo. He's on coming duty. And, uh, I'm like, all right, man, we're out of here. So we leave, you know, and he gets star case. Like as we're leaving, I'm like, see ya. The next morning I come in and on my desk in my office, is a piece of raft material. <laughs> <laughs> and on oh, it is no. written Stealthing Pride. Are you sure? And I'm like, what the? Harold. And, and he goes, thanks a lot, Chief. He goes, we got called out for a raft afloat. No one knew who it was. You're supposed to pop that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you're supposed to pop that raft, right? But direct deployment, you pick the third guy up and you go up. Like, I'm not going to get lower. <laughs> Like, oh man, I didn't let he he didn't let me live that down for a long time. I still have that piece of material. That is fantastic. Oh, that's <laughs> hilarious. Yeah. So that was that pretty much some of my career up right there. Oh god, that's great. You know what? I you gotta throw out a thank you to Lava. Just oh yeah, thanks. That's a, a little yeah. remembrance from that case. Yeah, thanks, I buddy. Them, so now I have it. <laughs> but you know, in a sense, he didn't really care because it gave him something to do. It gave him a flight and Lava was never one to shy away from a flight. So, no, nope. but it was oh, just funny. He's like, oh, luckily they saw that the name, he went down and got it and, you know, chopped it up and let it sink. But once they saw the name, like, oh, okay, we don't have to search anymore. So, yeah, son of a. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Lava. Thanks. Thanks for fishing that up for me. <laughs> well, so then 
then uh, it was time for retirement. And it was kind of cool because even to that day, I would still fly. And I remember the first couple of years and even to the end, flying out there thinking, man, I'm a swimmer. This is, I, I never expected to do this. And this is, I, and I wondered if other people felt that way. Like you, you get this feeling like, I love my job. This is so yeah. awesome. I, I, you know, so. I love this job. I, I love what we do. Love it. I think it's great what you're doing. You're still, you're still oh, doing this, right? That's, yeah, I am. I, I, yeah, I, I love to fly. I love to deploy. I love to, if it's in the back of a helicopter, I, I'm not a pilot, so I can't speak pilot side, but if, if you're doing it in the back, fast rope, rappel, hoist, jump, That's awesome. swim, I'm, I'm in. Like, let's, let's go have a good time. I, I still run outside when I hear a 65 fly by. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> when I hear the 60s roll across and I'm like, oh, just freaking beast. That's incredible. I remember going from the 65 to the 60 because I've spent my whole career in the 65 until I got to Cape Cod. Uh-huh. And I remember the pilot. And I think it was actually Tom Main, Commander Main. Commander Main. He was, he said, uh, you never flown in the 60? I'm like, no, no. He goes, all right, hold on, chief. I'm like, what? And he just straight up, lifted it straight up. And you don't do that in 65. Yeah, no. no, no. You need like a I, mile I, runway. <laughs> I used and to the, do, uh, the power is incredible. Oh, it's ridiculous. It, it, and there's no comparison between the two aircrafts uh, either. Yeah. Uh, I used to pick on the, the guys in the 65s because they'd lift up and then have to rock forward and backwards and forward and backwards and whoop, 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 <laughs> wee, take off. Yeah. And the 60s just like, get out of my way. <laughs> You're going to have to jettison some fuel if you want to do yeah. anything. Right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. It was a great, it was a great career. I mean, I, I love their men. I loved every, all the people. There's just, uh, friends for life, brotherhood for life, you know? Absolutely. I, what a great career. My gosh. Like I enjoyed it. You had some killer cases and too. This, I, like, had a, I had a public affair, my own public affairs specialist for four years. You know? All right. <laughs> <laughs> honey, honey, can we, can we write this one up, please? This is, this is fun. <laughs> yeah, when there was not much going on, she would put in like a uh, file footage of me or something. Or something. Oh, that's she great. The editor of, uh, there was a, the Harbor Watch. It was in New York. It was a paper okay. Harbor Watch for the for the tri service military, whatever. And she was the editor of that. So every once in a while, my picture would show up. Aww. Carol Hoffman coming back from a case, you know. <laughs> nice. Oh, excellent. <laughs> so. Man, ah, well, thank you for sharing all of those. Uh, I I'm gonna turn the floor over to you again and say, you know, like if there's something that you would pass on to the younger generation to guys that either are doing it or younger guys that are coming up, what, what, what advice would you give them right now? Uh, pretty much after listening to your uh, interview with Butch Flight, it's almost on the same line. Don't let, you know, like he said, don't let uh, the job identify you. My whole thing I tried to do in my career was I lived by a saying I had in my office and I don't know what verbatim, but it was basically if we die Tomorrow, someone will take our place at work. We'll get, we'll be replaced like that. Yeah. But the, the loss your family will feel, they'll feel that for the rest of their life. So why do we pour ourselves so much into our work than we do family? So yes, give a hundred percent of your job, do what you have to do. But when it's time to go home, go home. You know, don't, your job's always going to be there. No one ever sat around on their porch and said, man, on their deathbed and like, man, I wish I would have spent more time at work. You right. spend it with your family, you know, you, yeah. that, that's, that's what you want to do. Like one of the examples was as a chief, when I, was, I became a new chief, um, I got some crap because for, for, first of all, I'd always sit with my guys like, Oh, come on. You got to break the brotherhood. You know, you got chiefs now, which I understood, you know, chiefs, another brotherhood, yeah. but I didn't go to all their events. And I remember one of the master chiefs telling me, look, you need to start going to this event here and there and there. And I was big into coaching my kids. I coached everything from football, soccer, to basketball, to softball. Solid. And Good for you. That was my life. That was my outdoor life. And uh, I remember telling Mass Chief, and he understood it once I told him. I said, hey, I said, if there's ever a Chiefs meeting on the same night that I'm coaching youth soccer, youth soccer is going to win 100%. It's just going to win. I mean, yeah. I'll do my best to be with the Chiefs, Chiefs mess, but this is my family. I'm going to coach my kids. Yeah. So. So that's all I can, that, that's my advice is uh, have a great fun career. It goes quick, enjoy it. 
Luckily, people have cameras for everything now, you know? <laughs> it's almost yeah, ridiculous. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, remember your family. And yeah. I think it's great that so many swimmers have an outside life, like Chris Razak. Yeah. Photography. Dude, great. I mean, photography and, and, and these shirts and everything, it, have something else. And that'd be my advice. Don't let, yeah. it, uh, don't let it take over your whole life. So Beautiful. I feel like I I've talked it. way too long, brother. No way. Are you kidding me? I, I, keep, uh, I can't get enough of this stuff. You know this, right? <laughs> Harold, I cannot thank you enough for coming on and sharing everything that you just did. You just kind of like download an entire career and some killer advice. I, I cannot thank you enough. It's been a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Same here. So, same here. Uh, I I, we will definitely keep in touch after this and uh, definitely, man solid uh thanks dude thank you and with that ladies and gentlemen we are out of here thank you for tuning in we hope you enjoyed this episode of the real rescue podcast please take a minute to like subscribe and hit that share button i'm pulling jocks and taking off but before i go if anyone out there has a rescue story they would be willing to share I would be humbled and honored to have you on as a guest. Or if you have any questions about rescue or anything else we talk about here, send an email to jason at therealrescue.com. That's jason at T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q.com. You can also check us out on our web pages, therealrescue.com, our Facebook page, and our Instagram page, at therealrescue. Again, a special thank you to all of you standing on the watch today. Always remember, when that SAR alarm goes off, those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. Until next time, fly safe and swim hard.